Welcome to the Trauma Matters Podcast, a place where you can learn and hear about trauma in a way that's not so scary. Trauma reaches several spheres of our lives, our family, friends, our work, and even ourselves. This show is a space where you'll hear from practitioners in the field and survivors of trauma. Let's shake off the stigma of trauma and hear how real people are integrating trauma topics into normal everyday life. Hey friends, I hope you are all doing well and taking care of yourselves. Today friends, we're going to be talking about perhaps one of the hardest aspects of life, grief. Grief is something that we all go through. It's a tough subject for adults and it's a tough subject for kids too. As adults, we want to protect children from grief, but we don't have that ability. We will all experience grief at one point or another. My goal for today's episode is for you to hear the different ways we can normalize this conversation for children. Today we'll be talking with Kathy Fox, who serves as Assistant Professor and Field Education Director for the Social Work Program at Creighton University. As an alum of the program herself, she enjoys educating and supporting students as they prepare to become future helping professionals. Prior to moving to academia, she served over eight years as the Program Director and Director of Operation at Grief's Journey, a grief center here in Omaha, Nebraska. Her expertise includes social work practice in the field of grief and loss grounded in trauma, child development, and family systems with a strong background in mental health, suicide, and nonprofit administration. Her grief work has continued at the university where she teaches grief, loss, and bereavement, and continues to provide direct support to many grieving students. Kathy also serves on the board of directors for the National Alliance for Children's Grief. As a college faculty working with rising professionals, she has a particular interest in self-care, trauma-informed classrooms, and mental health among young adults. Needless to say, she is an expert in grief. I guarantee you will learn something from Kathy today. Just like me, Kathy talks about these things in a very trauma-informed way, but that does not mean you won't be emotionally affected. During our conversations, we will of course be talking about death, but we will also touch on the different ways those deaths can occur, like suicide and homicide. So please take care of yourselves as you listen. Let's go talk with Kathy. Well, Kathy, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Lizzie. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Can you tell me a little bit more about yourself, what you do? and Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I am currently the field education director at the social work program for Creighton University. Um, so my job is both teaching in the classroom, but also helping all of our students get connected out in the field. Most of my experience in practice as a social worker, though, has been in grief and trauma. So I've spent, oh, I would say between 10 to 12 years working directly with families after a death and while they're grieving various losses. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what we'll be talking about today. Yes, so, yeah. Yeah, so um, I thought it was important that when we're talking about youth trauma prevention that sometimes when we do experience a hardship, we experience a loss, that we still talk about grief. Even though like this is prevention focused, you know, sometimes our prevention efforts don't work or mm-hmm. sometimes we didn't get to someone soon enough. Um, so I just thought it was important that we take the time to talk about what grief means, what loss means. Yeah. Um, so what does grief really mean? What does that what does yeah, that word So mean? I would say really broadly, when I think about grief, it really is just our reaction to any kind of loss. Um, really, if we want to dive into it, there's grief, which is our inward reactions that we're having when there is a loss. And then there's also what we would say is mourning, which is the outward signs that maybe someone would see. Mm-hmm. You know, typically when we think about grief, for example, if someone dies, you would see someone doing things like maybe crying or going to the cemetery, attending a funeral. All of those outward signs are the mourning. All of the internal reactions, the thought processes, the emotions, all of that is our grief. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, it does go so hand in hand with trauma. I mean, sometimes people can experience a loss that impacts them in grief and also a trauma response. So mm-hmm. they can they can overlap quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And what does that overlapping look like? So it's difficult because usually the trauma responses that 
people have exacerbate how their grief is um, coped with Mm -hmm. and vice versa. Um, So really what we try to do when someone is experiencing both trauma and grief is to address both at the same time, providing many of the the therapeutic supportive interventions with trauma that you all have talked about, Mm -hmm. um, while also acknowledging the emotional loss that they have had and ways of coping with that Mm -hmm. piece as well. You said like the various types of loss. Mm -hmm. So is grief always around death or are there other things that we can grieve that isn't death? Yeah, not necessarily just death, although that's, you know, a huge piece of grief. Mm -hmm. Um, Any kind of loss that someone would experience is going or has the potential of causing grief. So when I think about kids, for example, you know, a common thing would be pet loss. Mm. Maybe someone in their life that has an illness or an injury that's impacting their function or maybe life limiting moves breakups friendship Mm -hmm. changes um divorces Mm -hmm. separation from family members due to immigration or incarceration all of those can Mm -hmm. create grief and those are unfortunately very common things that children go through yeah so it's not like it's not like children don't grieve even if they didn't lose someone by death. Yeah, absolutely. And quite frankly, I feel like grief is one of the most universal experiences. We all will have that at some point. Mm-hmm. We are not great talking about it, so no. I really appreciate that we're doing that yeah, today. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I think it's something that you know we all experience oftentimes multiple times in our lives, and yet we don't really talk or know how to support others who are grieving. Mm-hmm. Because it's, it's so uncomfortable because <laughs> you know the conversation's going to mm-hmm. be sad regardless. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of us like to avoid sad emotions as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times people, because they don't know what to say or how to respond, avoid it because they're worried about doing harm sure. or making someone feel worse. Sure. I think most people come in with good intentions uh-huh. trying to have an honest conversation but also trying to be comfortable and in our discomfort we can create uh, an environment that's not the healthiest or the most pleasant environment to have these conversations yeah and i will say though that most people at least the families that i've worked with when there's been a death would rather have someone come with good intentions and try than to just do nothing Mm. because I think there's a lot of grace people know it is uncomfortable Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'd rather have someone make the effort with good intentions not not trying to be cold of course um, but to at least acknowledge it how is grief different when it's expected say like an elderly grandparent versus a sudden death of like a friend like how would a child or a teen respond differently Mm -hmm. to those separate situations? I think first what I would want everyone to know is that grief is a very individualized experience. Mm -hmm. While it is universal in that we all experience grief, it really is dependent on, for example, with death, your relationship with the person who died, your own coping and personality, your support systems. Um, And so everyone really experiences grief what I would say is at 100%. Mm. Every loss I have, I'm going to grieve that fully. There are nuances, though, with like the example you gave. If I'm a child and I have an older grandparent, in general, most of us expect that someone who's older is Mm -hmm. going to die before someone who's younger. Mm -hmm. And so that shift in it being almost like out of the norm or out of what's expected can add extra confusion, Mm -hmm. extra challenges in in coping. Um, Also, especially when it is a youth who experiences the death of a peer, it's almost this reframe and worldview change, seeing that this is something that could also happen to me. It feels a little Mm -hmm. closer to home Mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, because we, most of us think like someone who dies is going to be older, Mm-hmm. They're going to have lived, a, hopefully, a long, wonderful life. Right. And that's the expected order of things. And so it does impact all of us differently when it is 
unexpected in that way out of out of like the typical quote unquote normal order mm-hmm. of things mm-hmm. is there a reason why like we have this idea of because you put quotations <laughs> around like typical and normal yeah. so is there a reason why we have like this differentiation between what we consider normal and like what we consider to be unexpected yeah or not normal well i mean of course none of us want to expect anyone to die before their quote like time is is due um when they are still young and have a lot of potential so I think that's part of it I do also think that especially for in like the mainstream American culture death feels so uncomfortable that if we can think about it being this far off distant thing it's kind of self-protective it doesn't feel like it can hit us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, so I do think that there's that extra discomfort then with it. You know, also with your question around how an unexpected death of, let's say, a, a young person might impact someone differently. You, typically, those deaths, not always, but a lot of times are due to more traumatic or violent situations. So things mm-hmm. like homicide, suicide, car accidents, Mm -hmm. accidental overdose. And that makes it challenging in a different way because that's where we have that added layer of trauma potentially brought in too, where maybe I've heard things about the death, seen images of it, or maybe Mm -hmm. I was even present when the death happened. Mm -hmm. And so that can add that extra layer of trauma processing too. Mm Mm-hmm. I lost a friend to suicide when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And so, like, as you're talking about, like, how we react differently, like, I can speak to how different I reacted to my grandmother's death versus my my friend's death. Like, that, my my entire being, like, was just completely different. I was 10 versus 17. Mm -hmm. So, like, at 10 years old, like, I knew my grandmother was sick. I knew um, she was in the hospital. I knew Mm -hmm. she had cancer. Like, I knew all of these things, Mm -hmm. right? And so, at... 10 years old I was kind of able to start start the grieving process before she before she passed away and so I was able to kind of be able by the time she did die I was able to kind of be able to say the sentence of like well I know I know she's not hurting anymore I was able to say Mm -hmm. all all the things like that versus 17 years old where I talked to my friend every single day Mm -hmm. and like we would text back and forth see each other every day at school hang out and then what do I do with that yeah it was just, it was a lot harder to process through. It was, it's truly, even now, like, because I'm, it's, that was almost 10 years ago now. Mm-hmm. Like, there's still moments where I feel like I'm still grieving. Oh, for you sure. You know, like, I feel like yeah. there's still moments where I'm still trying to process, mm-hmm. you know, him not being here. Mm-hmm. I There's so many moments where I find myself, like, you know, wondering about what would have been, and there's so much more versus yeah. than the unex- than the expected versus the unexpected. Yeah. Well, and you bring up such a good point too, because kids or teens mm-hmm. think about how much time is spent with their peers and with their friends versus maybe older family members. Right. Um, now, I know that's not the case for everyone, but in general, I would say that's the case for a lot. So, if it's someone that you're seeing daily. And for most hours of the day Mm -hmm. versus someone that maybe you're seeing once a week or once a month or a couple Mm -hmm. times a year, it is going to be different to process. And it is a lifelong process. You're not going to ever just be over it. You know, that's something that you'll... Absolutely. Um, So grief, going back to that original definition, Mm -hmm. is just your reaction to a loss. And it's a normal, healthy reaction. Mm -hmm. That's part of what makes us human. And in fact, I would say that we would be concerned if someone didn't have some sort of reaction after a significant loss. Sure. And so because it's a normal part of being human, it's a normal reaction, it's not actually something that we can fix. It's not something to get over. It's just something that becomes part of our our life and our story. It typically, with good coping, starts to change over time Mm -hmm. with that effort Um, but it's not necessarily something that ever goes away it Mm -hmm. just becomes different over time and how does it look different over time like like obviously Mm -hmm. it depends on the person Mm -hmm. but I think especially here in America 
it's like we have this idea that grief ends when the funeral's over right you know yes. like which is so untrue like yes. mm-hmm. in in actuality i think a lot of people's grief starts starts once the funeral's over mm-hmm. over because there's so much business to uh-huh. a funeral business to a loss of someone for sure and it's such a great distraction if you have to do those things so yeah i think a lot of times those reactions and emotions set in after the fact mm-hmm. when i think about it changing over time or how that can transform in your life if i think about like let's say like a prickly pine cone in a small glass jar mm-hmm. with the pine cone representing grief and that jar being your life around it that Prickly pine cone's probably going to be hitting the side quite a bit. So it's going to be touching you and hitting you very frequently. With good processing, good coping, good supports, our life should grow around that pine cone. So if you imagine eventually putting it in a medium sized jar and then in a larger size jar, it will still prick and hurt every once in a while as you shake that jar up, but there's more space around that pine cone, more space around that grief. So it's still there. Mm -hmm. Um, It hasn't changed, but it's integrated into your life in a different way. I see that similar metaphor of like a, uh, I think it's usually a ball, Mm -hmm. where it's like the ball stays the same size, your life around it just gets bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are some of the signs that adults should observe to recognize that a that a child is experiencing grief. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would say again, grief is going to be a normal reaction. And so if you already know that there has been a loss, looking for new reactions, even initiating conversations with the child is super important. If you don't know though, I always think that looking at a child's norm, looking at their typical baseline and seeing any changes from that are typically indicators that something else is going on and that something else could be grief so things like sleeping more or less Mm. eating more or less being more withdrawn or for some kids maybe being more engaged in schoolwork and over performing um, compared to their norm so i always think that baseline is like a really good indicator Mm -hmm. of it um and again while there's no right or wrong way to grieve and grief itself is normal there can be healthy and unhealthy coping Mm -hmm. so then i would always look for how does it seem that child is coping and how can i as the adult provide opportunities for healthier coping outlets Mm -hmm. what are some of those um unhealthy coping mechanisms that someone might Mm -hmm. go towards um you know typically when i think of preteens teens i think of all of those risk-taking behaviors Mm -hmm. drinking drugs um, reckless driving all of all of those types of things um but it can look a little more subtle too so like i i gave that example of sometimes kids after a loss may have more engagement with academics, for example, and almost overperform or have perfectionistic tendencies, um, which to me says that they are using that as an escape for their feelings Mm -hmm. or trying to to do something around protecting their feelings. Um, It can be being more withdrawn. That's definitely something that I I try to keep my eyes open for. you know, maybe anger outbursts, Mm. behavioral things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So if we see increased fighting with peers, fighting with family members, those may be some kind of red flags that those are saying something else is happening. Sure. I appreciate you bringing up um, like the Mm -hmm. over-engagement. My sister, when our grandfather passed, um, that's what she did. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were both in college. I was a senior, she was a sophomore. And um, me, so after, after, of course, after we get the information, um, I didn't go to school for like the whole week, you mm-hmm. know. Um, I took time for myself, took time to be with my family, but she was in every class, mm-hmm. you know. She was in every class um, doing every single homework assignment. I, I'm not, I'm sure she told her professors, mm-hmm. but it wasn't to the extent of like, hey, I need to take a break. It mm-hmm. was, hey, I'm going to be out for like a couple hours on this day for the funeral, but that's it. Mm-hmm. And um, 
it finally got to a point after the school year was over I went to go see her and uh I just kind of not in like a dramatic kind of way but I did when I walked into the house she was on the floor Mm -hmm. and I was like what you doing (laughs) and she's like I I don't know Mm -hmm. you know it was just this moment where it clicked for me like that's what you've been using to distract yep. yourself with school mm-hmm. and now that school's out you don't know now what to I do have all of this you have all of it because she had it for she had uh, about four months of mm-hmm. life of nice distraction yes yeah and so once school year was over she was just kind of like oh it's all hidden yeah. now and so like we talked and she was like I just don't think I ever fully processed it and I'm mm-hmm. like I know you didn't Mm-mm. it's like because you didn't sit down and and to be fair I too like you know I had moments where I I have a habit of trying to rush through my emotions mm-hmm. and so it's like, so much easier that way so much easier <laughs> and so for me like I hit around March and I was like well I should stop crying about mm-hmm. this now like I was mm-hmm. like I think I'm done now but <laughs> you know I'm really glad that you said like you know it does feel prickly for a while because mm-hmm. it does like it feels like why am I not getting better like why am I still sad about this the funeral's already over and you have yeah. all these why 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 questions but we don't get to pick yeah, how we long we are heavily affected because we'll always be affected, yep. like you said. But we don't get to pick how long it takes us to really get through the, the the beginning of the prickliness. Right. And I think such a myth with grief, too, is that that, quote, time can heal all wounds, which, of course, we know is not true. Mm-hmm. Um, because if it did, then if we avoided it for long enough, it would just go away. Mm-hmm. And But anything we do to distract ourselves, whether it's school or taking care of our family or alcohol and substances those are just masking it for that time it's Mm -hmm. not actually helping us get rid of it yeah and I think we're so good at masking things we We, are we like to be able to just put on because I also think we're not used to having to be vulnerable Mm -hmm. and grief is such a vulnerable process Mm -hmm. and experiencing a loss is very vulnerable because it you, is. if you don't have a reaction to it, people are shocked, mm-hmm. you know, because that's like the one time we feel like it's okay to cry yeah. and this is, it's okay to lean on each other, but there aren't many other experiences where we feel like it's okay. No. And yet we've also done a really good job, I think in our country at least, of creating this tidy idea of what grief should look like like you said it should Mm -hmm. only take those three days for Mm -hmm. us to plan the funeral we get all of our emotions and tears out at that point and then we should move on um and we also have such a discomfort with the thought of i think our own death our Mm -hmm. own limited Mm -hmm. humanity that fear that i think it just makes us feel like it should look a certain way Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. I used to always say the phrase, um, the only wrong way to grieve is not do it at all. Yeah. And I I still stand by mm-hmm. that. Like, I still stand by that. I think a lot of people, um, you know, try their best not to do it, but mm-hmm. I, I feel like that's the only wrong way. Like, if you, I don't want to say this correctly, mm-hmm. like, I understand the the urge to reach for alcohol or the urge to reach for drugs Mm -hmm. like I understand that because a lot of times sometimes people do mask for a little bit knowing Mm -hmm. that they can come out on the other side grieving quote-unquote correctly Mm -hmm. um but I do think there's a lot of people who just don't do it at all and I would much rather someone like grieve negatively than not do it at all yeah well and if you think about you know those initial definitions like Mm -hmm. grief grief is going to be there it's going to be your emotional reaction and how we choose to mourn or cope with it Mm -hmm. is going to make a difference yeah so sometimes a child and an adult are grieving at the same time especially if it's Mm -hmm. a family member Mm -hmm. um how can an adult still be a healthy outlet for a child if they're grieving too Research shows that the number one predictor of how a child will grieve is how the adults in their life mm. are grieving. So I actually think that you have such this is such a good question mm-hmm. um, because adults think they need to do it a certain way or be strong for their kids to help them um, when in actuality them role modeling how to grieve and how to 
display their emotions and find those good outlets, that is the most critical thing any adult could do. So I actually really encourage, it does take vulnerability, sure. um, but I encourage adults to be open and honest with their feelings, um, kind of helping with some of that emotional literacy with mm-hmm. kids, especially younger children, knowing what all of these different feelings are and what we can do about them. A great example I think of with this is several years back, I had had a mom contact me. She was concerned about her preteen son. I think he was probably about 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And dad had died. And the child had been kind of going through the motions, like responding typically, but she didn't really have any concerns for the most part after dad had died. He was just kind of functioning okay. And at she called me because at one point she had realized that she had overheard him crying in the shower and discovered that he had been doing that regularly. Mm. So while he seemed okay around her, he had been actually having a lot of intense emotions privately. I kind of shifted the conversation and I asked her how she was grieving because it was her spouse that had died. And through the conversation, I discovered that she was only crying alone in the shower. And what it really said to me was that family, she didn't intend that to be a problem, um, but she had taught her child that we don't grieve together, that this Mm -hmm. is done privately, that we don't talk about it. I would argue that by taking some of that vulnerability and being open with your kids, that's going to be the best thing that you can do. Yeah. Gosh, it's so powerful to think about because I, I, I'm, I'm putting connections mm-hmm. of like my own life too. Mm-hmm. Of like, I oftentimes see parents and their children grieve similarly. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm thinking about like my, like my family, like like my cousins versus like versus their parents. Their parents. Like, I can see it. Yeah. Like, I can see that they all grieve very similarly. I probably, I would say, I probably grieve pretty similarly to my mom mm-hmm. as well. Of like. We do talk about it. Like mm-hmm. we're both open about having those conversations. Um, we both try not to cry, but we do anyway. Yeah. You know, um, but I can definitely see that. Yeah. I can see how how that works yeah. in a family for sure. And it doesn't always have to be crying with mm-hmm. your child. If you guys aren't criers, you know, you can go for drives are a Mm -hmm. great time to talk to kids Mm -hmm. because they're not looking directly at you so using opportunities like that or um if they like to go play basketball go out and shoot some hoops and use that as a chance to talk Mm -hmm. um or to even just start to share some of those special memories or or thoughts that you're having just to start initiating the conversations Mm mm-hmm you know so many people have brought up having conversations in the car Mm -hmm. and yeah I do that too best place it really Mm -hmm. is I do it too my mom did it to me Mm -hmm. I do it to her now Mm -hmm. like it's I don't know it's just something so comfortable comforting about not having to like give someone that direct eye contact it feels a little safer it does Mm -hmm. yeah and so even so like I said it has it has been brought up multiple times on the show but like I just want to echo it again of like even tough conversations around death and grief can be a space for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I also want to point out something. I noticed that you have only said death and die. Like you have yes. not said pass away, move. Mm-hmm. I said pass mm-hmm. away, but I've noticed that. <laughs> I said it. So what is yeah. the importance of using the words? Mm-hmm. Like why is that so important? It's so funny because it's become so ingrained in me. I don't even notice it anymore. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad you asked. Mm-hmm. Um you know, that's another big thing for a, any adult with kids is, especially young kids, they are very concrete. And so we want to use language that is the truth. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, that means if someone is dying, they died, they experienced a death. So I get really comfortable with those words. Mm-hmm. I would encourage anyone listening to start getting comfortable with it because it's not something we usually use. Yeah. Um, and those mean such different things than saying someone passed away, Mm -hmm. which there's nothing wrong with saying that, but especially with kids, um, that's so abstract and it doesn't really make sense. Mm -hmm. So using the concrete language really starts to help them understand better. Mm -hmm. I even think too about how frequently we explain 
when someone died, it's like they went to a better place. And if you think about being a young kid, going to a better place may mean like going to an amusement park right. or going right. going to a restaurant. Like those are better places. And so, and it also begs the question, why aren't they coming back? Or when will they come back? Mm-hmm. Um, so even just changing to like really concrete language is helpful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I do think that's necessary for people to know. Mm-hmm. As you're talking, I was thinking about like, what was the language that was used for me mm-hmm. like as a kid. And I remember when my mom told me that my grandmother passed away, mm-hmm. once again, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> like, but obviously that's the language I grew up with. Yeah. I remember her saying like, grandma's in heaven. I was 10, so I understood what that meant. Yeah. Like I, I understood that, but... Um, I just I recognize that the verbiage that I use is directly tied to like what I was raised saying, which was passed away. Like yeah. we use that, and even if I do say that someone died, like it's usually it's someone I'm not emotionally connected mm-hmm. to at all mm-hmm. because I can say it for them, like mm-hmm. but I can't I can't say it for people who are like close to me. Right. Like that's for whatever reason that's harder. Mm-hmm. It's harder for me to say like oh my grandmother died. Like right. that does not come out naturally. Mm-hmm. Like. It just doesn't at all. Which I think is common. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do, again, think that so much of this is how we're socialized. And I do think that we live in a pretty death-denying culture. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also think that changing my language at least helps signal some that I am comfortable with the topic. So I think that's something that, like, for listeners who do want to be supportive to their friends to who are adults or children or whoever Mm -hmm. um that even just shifting your language shows i'm going to reduce some of that stigma Mm -hmm. and i am someone that's at least trying to get comfortable with the topic yeah what do you think adults get wrong about children's Mm -hmm. grief so much i do (laughs) yeah go for it and i do think it's so well intended yeah um so you know young kids, right? Mm-hmm. If you, if I had to ask you, how would you describe the attention span of a child? What would you say? Oh my gosh, it's like two seconds long. Right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like one conversation and the next conversation, but some, somehow there's still one conversation. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I always ask that because we know that about kids. Yeah. It's the same thing with grief. Mm-hmm. Um, but for so many adults, they think because kids, move like that and have such a short attention span it means that they don't understand like grief or loss or death Mm -hmm. um, and that they're too young to grieve and so I think that's such a good example because Mm -hmm. when a child is grieving they will still grieve there's not an age too young to grieve including infants of course they can't verbalize it but you can see responses in them Mm -hmm. um but that you're going to expect that they're going to have short short bursts, just Mm -hmm. like their attention span. They're not going to be able to sit and talk to us about it for hours on end. In fact, it might just be a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. And then they bounce on to something else. Mm -hmm. Um, But it doesn't mean that they don't understand. So I think that's a a huge thing to remember. That's probably my number one Mm -hmm. takeaway is that they are not too young to get it. They're not too young to grieve. Mm -hmm. With that goes exactly what I was talking about with the language of how important it is for us to be concrete and open and honest with children because they're not too young to understand and they need to have the truth in order to start processing it. So even using that language that someone died, for young children explaining what it means when someone dies, that Mm. they're not coming back, Mm -hmm. um, that their body stops working, they're not sleeping, it's different. Um, but even with older kids, being open and honest around things like causes of death, like mm. this person died of suicide, mm-hmm. and it's okay to use that and say that word, mm. um, that will really be helpful in setting the tone of of their next steps in processing mm-hmm. the grief of that truth. I also think something that adults get wrong is that children are just naturally resilient and they'll bounce Mm, back. mm -hmm. As we know, resilience is something that is built. It's something that we also have to help our kids grow and stretch that muscle, um, which goes back to some of that role modeling that I was mentioning before Mm -hmm. too, and um, that adults don't need to be strong, quote unquote strong, to protect their children because then that's what children think they need to do for their adults. 
I would say those are the main takeaways um, of the things that I, adults get wrong. Those are probably the, my key ones. Mm-hmm. The last one I would say, though, is there's this idea that when a child is grieving, the adults in their lives need to be more lenient um, because what the child is going through is so stressful that we want to be flexible with them. I would say this is like a partial myth or a partial truth because, yes, we do want to be more flexible. We want to be understanding of their stress. And also, one of the biggest things that children need when they are grieving is more structure and routine. Mm. Because if you think if you think about it, you know, yeah. when someone dies, it feels like our whole world is out of control. Yeah. There's not a lot we can count on. It feels really even if it's an expected death, it feels like everything's unexpected right mm-hmm. now. And so it's really important for kids to have expectations and structure and routine, and that will help them feel at least a little sense of control over their life. Mm. Um, Like they know what to predict in some small ways. Does the same thing apply to teens as well? For sure. Really? Yes. Um, And even though they will not always vocalize Mm -hmm. that, um, teens need the same thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was a teenager I was working with several years ago, and her older brother, who was also a teenager, had died of suicide. Mm -hmm. And she had a lot of wisdom and was really able to vocalize this, I think, in ways that most teens wouldn't. But she was telling me one day, she said, you know, after my brother died, my parents have been so worried about me that they've really, like, let go of all the rules. I don't have a curfew. They don't care mm. what I do. Doesn't matter if I'm not doing my homework because they're so worried about me after my brother's death. And she said, I'm honestly just kind of pushing the boundaries to see when they're going to step back in. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I would like that took me wow. aback that she could yeah. say that. Like she knew I want my parents to still be my parents. I want my teachers to still be my teachers and expect things of me. Mm. Again, I don't think most teens would actually tell us that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they they also need that just as much as young children do. They're still developing. Yeah. They they need some of that dependability. So it's a personal reason why I asked. Mm-hmm. So like I said, I lost a friend to suicide when I was in high school. And um, the day after his death, I was supposed to go do my ACT. Mm. And I was dumbfounded by the fact that my mom said I still had to go take my ACT. Mm-hmm. I was like, how dare you? Mm-hmm. Uh, no. <laughs> and I still went. Uh-huh. But... You know, that just gave me some insight to maybe there's something she knew Mm -hmm. that I didn't know. Um, Because I was just like, I cannot believe, like, you're having me go to this school right now and take this test. Like, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But as you say that, I'm like, you know, I still had expectations during Mm -hmm. that time. I was still very much allowed to grieve 100%. -hmm. Like, my teachers were great. My mom was great. My family, my friends were great about all of it. Um... But I did also have moments where I'm just like, I just don't want to do anything yeah, anymore. Yeah. You know, I did have moments where I'm like, I did stop doing my homework. I'll just put it out there. <laughs> I, I, I did stop doing that. I was also a senior, so I was like, I got oh, to the yeah. college. I wanted screw this mess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I still needed structure. Mm-hmm. 100% I did. Um, because if I felt, if I was left to my own devices, mm-hmm. psh, <laughs> who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. When I say, you know, it's that it's like a partial truth mm-hmm. because I do think that there's flexibility 100%. in there, right? Like we're going to mm-hmm. we're going to understand that you're still going to need to grieve and that we're going to have to adjust some things and have different expectations. But yeah, like you said, if we just take off all expectations or just kind of let kids do their own and teens do their own thing, I know even as a non-grieving teen, most would yeah, most would probably not yeah. get a whole lot accomplished. <laughs> no, not at all. Not mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. And so going back to that structure piece, I think mm-hmm. that makes another question is, mm-hmm. what is a school's role in a child's grieving? Yeah. Um, 
Because I have ideas of what I thought was really good. Yeah. But then I've also seen things go not so good. So yep. I'm curious to know. And what I would thoughts. say the same. I've seen really great and mm-hmm. I've seen very much opportunities for improvement. I um, love how you said that. <laughs> <laughs> we're we are growth mindset. Yes, love yes. it. Love mm-hmm. how you said that. <laughs> um and I, I do think that most of the time though when there's mistakes or opportunities, it's because we don't know. Yeah. Adults don't always know. Right. Um if it is one child or one student or one family that's impacted. I think it's really helpful if the school can have pre-contact with that student and family before they return to school Mm. to really create an individualized plan. Um, So along with that structure and routine, because our world feels so out of control, it's also important for people who are grieving to have some choice to feel like they can regain some sense of control. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when a student returns, let's say a sibling or a parent has died, they've been gone for some period of time and are coming back to school, I think it's helpful to create a plan for the student of what reentry to the classroom looks like, what would feel supportive for them. Do they want there to be an announcement to the class? Do they want to just kind of sneak in and fly under the radar? Um, What do we do if the child starts to become really emotional in class? I'm an advocate for giving them um, like a a pass, basically, Mm -hmm. where if I'm starting to get upset in the classroom, I'm allowed to leave, go to the counselor's office, go to the principal's office to have some space where I'm not sitting in the classroom trying to not cry or lose it in front of all of my friends and Mm -hmm. classmates. Um, I like to send, give a safe space like that too, where it's like, okay, when I feel this way, I'm going to have a free pass to go to the counselor's office, not just roam the halls by myself too. So it's again, that structure. Mm -hmm. Now, if it is a death that has impacted the whole school, there are a few other things that I would do. When, When we are addressing students, it is important for them to all know the truth. Mm -hmm. Um, to the extent that the family is willing to have them share that. In cases of suicide, I do think it's important for the entire school to hear that it was a suicide and to hear the same story. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's Mm -hmm. so, I'm sure you and listeners can think about how often a couple people hear one thing, a couple people hear another, and especially in our world of social media, it's going to spread like rapid fire and it's maybe not always the truth. Right. So I think if the school can always tell all of the students and all of the families the same thing together, it's also important for the school to um, offer resources. So we talk about suicide, for example. One of my favorite phrases is that suicide postvention, meaning what we do after a suicide, is one of the most important pieces of suicide prevention. Mm-hmm. And so doing things like normalizing mental health support, talking about warning signs, what do you do if you're worried about one of your friends, and provide those resources. Here's the counselor. Here's the crisis team who's going to be here for a few days. Here are some groups in the, or organizations in the community you can reach out to for support. But normalizing that mm-hmm. is important. And then I also think that schools need to think about how they want to memorialize the student or faculty or teacher who died, Mm -hmm. um, because that is important. That's a normal part of grief is doing something. Um, It's just a matter of what, and then it should be the same for every student or faculty teacher who dies. Um, So one of my colleagues would often say, she goes, it may sound great to plant a tree for someone after a death, but if you anticipate doing this for 10 years, do you have the space to plant a tree for yeah. every single person who dies? Right. So thinking about what's realistic for your school too. Mm. I really appreciate all of those tidbits and, and suggestions because um, I, I really <laughs> am able to pull out like what my school did what well worked. and mm-hmm. what I think didn't. And if we're having a conversation about normalizing grief, we also have to be rec- we have to recognize that there are some students, some kids, teens who are ready to normalize it, mm-hmm. who want to have those mm-hmm. conversations. And I think I can say from personal experience, I think one thing that adults get wrong mm-hmm. is the fact that 
their discomfort does not mean it's my discomfort. Right. I'm totally comfortable with memorializing my friend. Just because yeah. you're uncomfortable with it doesn't mean that it shouldn't happen. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, okay, if a couple people cry, we're all going to be crying at graduation we're be crying. anyway. Mm-hmm. Like, whatever. Mm-hmm. It was already going to happen. Crying's okay. Yeah. Just because something makes us sad doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah. Um, and I would say, too, as you're talking about this, one of the things that I think about for – especially for any school people that mm-hmm. listen – is to plan ahead. I yeah. mean, to talk about plans now, what would we do if a student died, regardless of if you're in elementary school or high school, um, instead of trying to, I've seen so many schools try to figure it out after it happens, when usually the teachers are also grieving at that point. Yeah. You're trying to manage your students who are grieving, and that's not the time for us to make those decisions. Mm-mm. It should have happened a while ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's one of those things that is unfortunate that we have to plan for, mm-hmm. but it's a natural plan. But it happens. It happens. It does. And, I, and I, I've seen it happen while in school. So this is just K through 12, not college. Yeah. While in school, oh gosh, we, uh, one of my schoolmates died from cancer in elementary mm-hmm. school. Um, while I was in high school, while in high school, I believe I believe we had three suicides. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, obviously, it's not uncommon. Right. So there should be a plan for Something. it. I agree with mm-hmm. you. Yeah. yeah. Upswing time. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are youth changing conversations around grief nowadays? I think social media has been a huge piece mm-hmm. of it. Um just the fact that we now have those additional platforms and outlets for grief. Like, mm-hmm. I've seen so many students or kids, youth, teens, um, you know, have, like, TikTok videos about someone who died or sharing memories. And so I think just even, like, normalizing those conversations is huge. Mm-hmm. And the more we've normalized or the more that we do talk about it, the more comfortable others become. And so hopefully my goal would that we be that we have, like, a total – overhaul of our culture and do become ones that can talk about it share memories acknowledge the fact that this is something that will happen to all of us yeah um so i think that those are big things i think especially as youth grow up who had experiences when they were children i think they become then better advocates for future generations so Mm -hmm. i think that's a helpful piece as well um but i just i see current youth being so much more comfortable talking about things that older generations have not been, including my generation. Mm -hmm. Like youth nowadays are doing amazing things around all sorts of hard topics. Mm -hmm. And I I appreciate that they're not afraid to talk about Mm -hmm. these things. And I mean, I have two younger siblings and so there are certain things that they'll bring up and be like oh my gosh I I can't even (laughs) fathom like bringing that up when Mm -hmm. I was your age you know and things like that but it does put things into perspective of like I think people are so tired of hard things being stigmatized yes I think they're just so exhausted of not being able to have answers Mm -hmm. not being able to have conversations not being able to reach out for help because you don't know who's going to be uncomfortable yeah And I feel like so many young people are just like, I'm over it. So I'm going to be the person that starts the conversation. I'll start the TikTok about grief. I'll start the TikTok about, Mm -hmm. you know, suicide prevention. I'll put it up on YouTube, wherever. You know, Mm -hmm. I I definitely do see that. I do see a lot more videos of people talking about, matter of fact, there was one that actually caught me off guard um, Mm -hmm. talking about stigma. Mm -hmm. Um, There's this young woman, um, I believe she's on TikTok, um, I'm only on YouTube, so I get every <laughs> YouTube shorts. Um, but she opens up every TikTok with, it's been blank amount of days since my dad killed my mom. Oh, wow. And mm-hmm. I and so she talks about, like, what that process has been like for her. Yeah. And I, the very first one I saw, I was like, oh, and she's talking about this? Mm-hmm. But I took a step back and was like, you know, there's probably several people in the world who've experienced yeah. something similar, and now they feel... Like, they can connect to another yeah. person yeah. who experienced something that a lot of us can't even fathom. Mm-hmm. And and I, there's nothing yeah. wrong with you because no. you experienced this thing. Yeah. doesn't mean that something's wrong with you. Right, right. 
And I think some people might need to hear that. Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's not your fault that you're experiencing something like yep. this. That's yeah. not. You. I can't tell you how many youth I worked with that felt like they were the only ones. Mm. And they may have been the only ones who were grieving in their classroom um, or in their school, at least to their knowledge. But if everyone has this, like, secrecy or, like, lack of talking about it, then they feel so isolated and it feels like something's wrong with them. Mm. Yeah, that's so true. So I love that people are starting to, youth are starting to like really push it more. I am Mm -hmm. too. As sad as it is, it does make me happy to see that um, we can have conversations about it. What is the importance of peer support during grief? And how can youth support each other during grief, especially when it is a loss of a classmate or a Mm -hmm. friend? I think that goes right back to what we were just talking about, how important it is for kids to not feel like they're alone or the only ones or that something's wrong with them. Um, You know, going back to the beginning of our conversation that grief is something that does happen to all of us in some fashion. It is a normal, healthy reaction to a loss. And so peer support is huge because when I've worked with kids in groups, it's like they have this light bulb moment where they're like, oh, I'm not the only one. Oh, I don't have to like dance around questions asking about my family because I can just say, yeah, my dad died or yeah, my sister died and talk about it without feeling like this shroud of secrecy Mm -hmm. or stigma. Mm -hmm. I also think that... I don't think we give youth enough credit, (laughs) for sure. Agreed. And I also think that especially when youth have experienced similar losses, they can talk to peers who are going through similar things in ways that adults just don't get. Mm -hmm. Um, Because they're just more authentic. I think they're more real. They don't have those same fears about saying the wrong thing that sometimes adults do. They can just be like, oh, your sister died? my brother died what was her name Mm -hmm. what was her favorite thing to do tell me about her you know Mm -hmm. and it just is a normal conversation versus adults trying to fix them or feel bad for them Mm -hmm. um they can just be themselves so my my best friend and i we actually met at creighton Mm. um and uh one thing that we do have in common is we both lost a friend to suicide in high school Mm. And so when I went to go visit her uh, back in September, uh, we were doing like a ceramics painting. And I don't know what what sparked me to ask, but I asked her about like what was her school's response mm. to her friend's death because I was wondering if it was similar to mine. Mm-hmm. See, because I've never talked to someone outside of the people who I went to school mm-hmm. with, like what it was like. We spent like an hour and a half just painting and talking about it and it was in in public too like Mm -hmm. we're just like having an open conversation about what it was like to be in school Mm -hmm. after that and it was there was something so healing about that conversation just recognizing that one our experiences were very different Mm -hmm. but two just being able to talk so openly about our friends that we lost like they were sitting right there yeah and i just don't think like you said like i just feel like a lot of adults would be like oh no you can't talk about that in Mm -hmm. public or like oh let's talk about this later wait till we get in the car we get into hush places yeah we're gonna whisper exactly (laughs) no but we're talking we're laughing like because it's, it's how you honor people it is it's how you honor and memorialize people being I, I think of um, I think of the movie Coco mm-hmm. like uh, and then of course like just the day of death in general like I think about if I were to stop talking about my friend mm-hmm. like I think about how in Coco like when someone is forgotten yeah. then they die a second time yeah. and I don't want that to happen Mm-mm. I don't want there to be a second death Mm-mm. like I want it to be the one and done and Yep. We're still memorializing this person. They're still living on in memory. And most of us who've had deaths want to talk about those people. Yes. You know, we want someone to ask us or we want an opportunity to show a picture or tell that funny story or memory. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I love too about your example is I think so many people think grief just has to be sad. And there's literally thousands of emotions that people can experience with happiness and joy and relief also being some of that Mm. and you Mm -hmm. can you can have that joy and 
relish those those memories in your grief Mm -hmm. like those aren't those aren't mutually exclusive yeah that's a great point because I do think a lot of us think grief is synonymous with sad yeah but it it really isn't always Mm -hmm. sad no and I think life isn't always it's not no and I think going back to your question about like what can adults do to support kids is also acknowledge they don't have to be sad it's okay if they are sad Mm -hmm. but they can also be angry they can also have fun they can also be relieved that that person died especially if you think about like a long drawn out illness Mm -hmm. um they can be jealous of their friends who haven't had to go through this you know the list goes on and on yeah I appreciate you speaking to that because I just I just don't think that people understand or at least don't know how to verbalize the fact that I woke up one morning and I was relieved. Yeah. Like, yeah. And then there's stigma about that, yeah. right? They're like, but yeah, oh, that's no. okay. <laughs> yeah, like, that's, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. What's something you wish you knew about grief as a child? I wish I knew that it was normal and it's something that happens to everyone. And I also wish I knew that it was something that you can and should talk about. Mm. And I think those messages especially as I was growing up were not always things that were upheld or validated Mm -hmm. again I think nowadays we're doing better Mm -hmm. but I want kids to know that more and more Mm -hmm. how does grief help a child belong it's a good question I think there is a part of grief, regardless of what the initial loss is, um, but I do think that it connects us with our humanity, and mm-hmm. I think it helps us connect with one another. I don't wish grief on anyone, but I also know it is something that we all experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... For a lot of the kids that I've worked with, youth, kids and teens, there have been parts of their grief experience that have actually helped them grow. In fact, there's been some research on a phenomenon called post-traumatic growth, Hmm. which essentially um, has looked at opposite to post-traumatic stress. It's the response where there is not just bouncing back to our baseline, but actual growth in certain areas following a significant loss like a death. And a lot of the individuals I've worked with would in a heartbeat want the person who died back, Mm -hmm. but also wouldn't change the growth and the learning that they've had Mm. because of the loss. And I don't know if that makes sense. It does. But it's like a double, it's like a both and. Yeah, yeah. I, I can definitely agree with that, like, just from, like, personal experience. Mm-hmm. If I could have my friend back, I would. Absolutely, in a yeah, for sure. Snap my fingers, I bring it back, like, red or blue <laughs> pill. Like, right. <laughs> yes, like, 100%. But I did grow a mm-hmm. lot, you know. I learned a lot. I now know um, how to respond to someone mm-hmm. um, who experienced an unexpected death. Like, I, I can now relate to what that feels like Mm -hmm. because one of the questions I had I had internally for so long was why is my response to his death so much stronger than like my grandmother's or my grandfather's like I I still cry about his I rarely ever cry about theirs Mm -hmm. like I had so many questions of like does this mean that I loved him more than right. my grandparents? Like, does this mean that my grandparents didn't really have an impact on mm-hmm. me? Like, whatever that meant. Like, I had so many questions. But when I finally was able to answer all those questions and recognize, no, it doesn't mean you mm-hmm. love love him more. No, and even if I did, that's okay. Mm-hmm. Like, that's okay. It, even if I did, it's like it doesn't mean anything bad. It just means that this death really impacted yeah. me at a very pivotal point in life I was 17 Mm -hmm. you know it's like like I said I was able to kind of plan for my grandmother so I was kind of I was kind of able to plan for my grandfather's Mm -hmm. as well but um his mm -mm, no plans for none whatsoever so yeah I'm gonna go through the motions yes a couple weeks ago I was crying about it just because I I still like you said I am still gonna be in grief it just looks different depending on where I'm at in life and Mm -hmm. what I've learned from the years prior yeah and I hear so many of the people I've worked with that have things like, you know, I 
I totally shifted my values after this person died. Mm. I really cherish my friendships and my relationships mm-hmm. more. You know, I used to put in so many hours at work just to, to get ahead. And after this death, I've realized there's more to life than that. So I think there's, yeah, it doesn't have to be either or. You can want that person back and also recognize and appreciate some of the growth that comes out of it or can come out of it. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to a teen who is experiencing a loss? First and foremost, as much as possible, don't judge yourself. It's so easy to think all of those would have, should have, could have. I even heard you just say, you know, asking those questions. Um, And so try not to judge yourself as much as possible and to give yourself permission and acknowledge all of your feelings, that they are okay, they're valid. This is a quote-unquote normal reaction to the loss that you've endured. Um, The emotions aren't good or bad, but I am going to encourage all of you to consider what is healthy and unhealthy coping again and to use those healthy coping outlets. They may not always be easy. Um, It's not going to be a quick fix, um, but it will help in the future. And then I would also encourage finding some supportive adult in your life, whether it's someone in your family, in your school, a mentor, a coach, a neighbor, someone from your place of worship, wherever, to seek that out and open up to them. Reach out for help, especially if you have concerns about harming or self-harm, suicidal thoughts or ideation. Um, And find those peers and friends who will support you in those healthy ways as well. Those would be my main tips. So with everything that you do, the things (laughs) that you talk about, Um, So even though you've done a really good job of destigmatizing conversations around grief and loss, I still think that it's still emotional work. It's still hard. Mm -hmm. So what do you do to take care of yourself? Oh, my students know. I always say self-care is work. It Mm -hmm. should be hard. It's Mm -hmm. not just the easy stuff um, that we wish it would be. Otherwise, everyone would do it. So um, I would say for me, I really try to be intentional as much as possible to be holistic with it. Um, So things like physically taking care of myself, for me, movement is important. So I'm the person that does need to go work out multiple times a week. Um, Whether I want to or not, that helps me. Relationally, making sure that I do spend time with my friends and family and people who uplift me um, and make me feel happy leaving, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, leaving that interaction. I will admit it is hard for me to always carve out that time. So it is something I try to be intentional about. I do try to find safe, confidential spaces to dump as well. Those people that I can just say, you know, hey, can I just vent to you for five minutes about this experience? And so having those people are really helpful. I I think that all helping professionals should have their own helping professionals. Mm -hmm. Um, So seeking counseling or therapy or coaches um, is really important for me in self-care. And then then just like the mindless stuff as well. I am someone who likes to either read or do a puzzle or watch a mindless TV show and intentionally carve out alone time because when – you are supporting others so much. For me, as an introvert, it's really important for me to recharge by myself as well. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Lizzie. And having this, you know, I I can't even call it a tough conversation because it was so easy, but like just a tough topic, you know, for people um, to just learn from and grow from, I hope. That's my hope for, you know, people who are listening, just that they're able to learn something and grow from it. And thank you for acknowledging this topic that is not always comfortable for people. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) I I felt like a disservice if I didn't. I felt like it was necessary to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Grief is hard. There's no doubt about that. But I fully agree with Kathy. It's one of the emotions that connect us as human beings. We will all eventually grieve. When I experience a loss, one of the first things I hear people do is connected to a loss that they have had. I'll be honest, that used to bother me. 
It used to bother me because it made me feel like they were centering the conversation around their experiences rather than mine. Then I realized what they were doing was showing me that they could <clears throat> Then I realized what they were doing was showing me that they could relate and understand what I was going through. They wanted me to know that they too had lost someone and they could be a person that I go to when I need it. Once I was able Once I was able to reframe that in my mind, it helped me recognize that in these moments of grief, what we want the most is connection. Kathy, thank you again for talking with me on the subject. It is always a pleasure seeing you. Thank you all for listening. I thought I heard the toilet. <laughs> thank you all for listening. Take care of yourselves, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Trauma Matters podcast. For topic suggestions, send an email to tmoshared at projectharmony.com. That's T M O S H A R E D at projectharmony.com. Visit traumamattersomaha.org for more information on trauma and building resilience. To learn more about Project Harmony, the services provided, and available trainings, visit projectharmony.com. Follow us on social media at Project Harmony and on Twitter at Project Harmony 2. Thanks again for listening. Take care of yourself, and I'll catch you in the next episode.